Hi, my name is Bob Grinia and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So I just wanted to show you this paper that I found. It is from last year and it is called New Highly Radioactive Particles Derived from Fukushima Daiichi Reactor Unit 1 Properties and Environmental Impacts. And if I just read the introduction here, it is saying... A contaminated zone elongated towards Fatuba Town, northwest of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, FDNPP, contains highly radioactive particles released from reactor unit 1. There are uncertainties associated with the physiochemical properties and environmental impacts of these particles. In this study, 31 radioactive particles were isolated from surface soils collected 3.9 kilometers north northwest of the FDNPP. Two of these particles have the highest particle associated 134 plus 137 cesium activity ever reported for Fukushima. 6.1 times 10 to the 5 and 2.5 times 10 to the 6 becquerels per particle are after the decay correction to March 2011. The new highly radioactive particles labelled FTB1 is an aggregate of flaky silicate nanoparticles with an amorphous structure containing 0.8 weight percent cesium occasionally associated with silicon dioxide and titanium dioxide inclusions. FTB1 likely originates from the reactor building, which was damaged by an H2 explosion after absorbing vo volatilized cesium. The 134 plus 137 cesium activity in the other highly radioactive particle labeled FTB26 exceeded 10 to the 6 becquerels. FTB26 has a glassy carbon core and a surface that is embedded with, a, with numerous microparticles, lead, tin, alloy, fibrous, aluminium, silicate, calcium carbonate or hydroxide, and quartz. The isotopic signatures of the microparticles indicate neutron capture by boron, cesium volatilization, and absorption of natural barium. The composition of the microparticles on FTB26 reflects the composition of airborne particles at the moment of the H2 explosion. Owing to their large size, the health effects of the highly radioactive particles are likely limited to external radiation during the static contact with skin. The highly radioactive particles are thus expected to have negligible health impacts for humans. By investigating the mobility of the highly radioactive particles, we can better understand how the radiation dose transfers through the environments impacted by Unit 1. The highly radioactive particles also provide insights into the atmospheric conditions at the time of the Unit 1 explosion and the physiochemical phenomena that occurred during the reactor meltdown. Now, you may remember this. Uh, this is the explosion. And I remember, I think I even saw this live uh, as it was being streamed. Uh, certainly, that's what my memory tells me, but it may have happened shortly after. I don't believe this is just a hydrogen explosion. And uh, the reason for that is I believe that this is a hydrogen cluster explosion. And this is essentially what um, it's a it's a charge cluster, but with uh, protons being the uh, ions in the charge cluster structure uh, predominantly, although there could be deuterons and tritons, given that it is a nuclear reactor, there could be sufficient numbers of those. I don't believe this is simply a hydrogen explosion. And this is on Rex Research, and it's talking about uh, radiation remediation, and one of the ones we're going to be trying uh, with the Kerala Black Sand, uh, because we can't get access at the moment to tritium, because of uh, barriers placed. Um, when uh, there's a claim in the 1980s in the press where um, Brown is uh, stating that the radioactive material gets converted uh, to uh, harmless carbon and uh, this is supported by many other researchers and one of those is Takaki Matsumoto and Matsumoto is saying that in his NATO model hydrogen clusters from electrons and uh, protons are formed although uh, it can be any atom and any atom can go into this and when the matter collapses 
and this is quite similar language to that used by Yul Brown, uh, implosion, then uh, in Matsumoto's findings it almost doesn't matter what you put in, you get carbon out of the end result and we've seen this in a number of different systems. And so why is this important? Well, um, well if we actually look at these particles uh, that have been observed, um, and I'm going to go to one section here, and the, the, the notion is here that uh, essentially all of the radioactivity is removed, 96% uh, claimed here, um, and if I go to glassy up here, and we'll just look at this down here, Right, so given its transparency, the carbon core was tentatively identified as glassy carbon. So unlike FTB1, FTB26 consisted of mainly glassy carbon core with uh, these type of bonds. Numerous fine particles were embedded in the surface around the carbon core. Based on SIMS analysis, only these fine surface particles are associated with cesium and boron. No significant cesium and boron contents were found in the glassy carbon core. Thus, the core is non-radioactive. So the idea that this material uh, came out of the reactor and the core of it has literally no radiation in there at all, I believe is because what is going on is it was a cluster and if we look down here, I think it is, uh, let's have a look down here. This is the sample and it's been put in a resin matrix so that it could be cut and polished and you can see actually how uh, incredible the um, the uh, here how glassy it is if I can actually it's doing it to me again <laughs> uh, yeah not here yeah this is really, really glassy and very consistent. We've seen this in other systems, and you can see here all these usual suspects. But of course, they can come from the environment. So the carbon is totally uh, the main part of the structure. And look, it's 500 microns that, so it's quite large. This is like uh, 0.75 of a millimeter by, I don't know, 5, 1, 2, 2 and a bit millimeters long. It's actually a large particle here. Now, from Matsumoto's work, the uh, structures can actually form um, elongated shapes when they get very big. So um, if we are to assume that all of the material inside, now ordinarily these structures tend to produce, um, how should we put this, uh, hollow structures. But if they wet together and the whole thing is fluidized, uh, in not necessarily molten, but fluidized, then you can imagine a glassy structure with no crystal forms could occur. And then as that kind of like uh, settled out, it would pick up fragments uh, from uh, on its sheath, as it were. So I am going to put forward uh, the proposal that these radioactive particles were ejected from a uh, cascade charge cluster uh, explosion. And uh, it's like a Coulombic explosion like we've seen in Vega. Uh, and it would be a detonation, and the detonation would uh, it would go through the charge clusters in the environment of the reactor. The charge clusters would be uh, synthesized by radioactive components uh, that are emitting gamma rays and high energy uh, beta and X rays, and this would create the charge clusters in the environment, as has been observed by Shishkin. And I'm going to be sharing soon the translations that I'm working on uh, with uh, another colleague uh, from Ukraine uh, of Shishkin's work and this ties into the fact that um, Chernobyl uh, uh, and an another disaster in the former Soviet Union uh, were related to charge clusters and I think that uh, there's something very very incredibly important to be considering uh, uh, as we move into a greater use of nuclear energy, which I think is absolutely necessary when we move forward. If we do not understand that you can have these char charge cluster explosions and how they can trigger X, Y, and Z, um, we are going to be making a grave, grave mistake. But I think it, we can use it to our advantage for remediating nuclear waste.
So that's all I wanted to say. So the paper is again, uh, it's called um, here, yeah, new highly radioactive particles derived from Fukushima Daiichi reactor unit one, and I recommend you go and read it. I will give you a link uh, to it in the description. And uh, yeah, so I, I believe that the core of this material is not radioactive because um, uh, this is transmuted material of whatever was available. Other things to note are that there's lead there. And of course, if you uh, do a lot of Lena, you get a lot of lead production. And if you do, um, uh, there is also tin as well. And so if you do transportations between things like nitrogen and lead, uh, you get tin production. And so uh, I believe that this is a signature of charge cluster driven nuclear reactions by the Lena process. And uh, I just wanted to put that out there. So thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.